Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This morning, a Falcon Heavy took off carrying what I like to call its most metal mission yet, the Psyche spacecraft. Which isn't NASA's foray into psychology, no, it's a mission to go and visit the asteroid Psyche. Or more correctly, 16 Psyche, as it was the 16th asteroid discovered. It was discovered by uh, Annibal de Gasparis in 1852. And as was the custom of the time, it was named after the Greek goddess Psyche, a goddess of the soul. And the mission was specifically targeted at this asteroid because the asteroid is the largest M-type asteroid. M for metal. Because it's believed, based on their spectra and their high radio reflectivity, that these asteroids contain a large amount of metal in them. And when the Psyche mission was originally proposed in 2014, Scientists believe that there was a pretty good chance that this object was in fact the exposed iron-rich core of a protoplanet that had subsequently been smashed and had the lighter silicates removed off the surface. And that would make it a very interesting target for studying the evolution of the early solar system. However, since then, astronomical observations have uh, suggested that this may not actually be the case. In particular, teams have been able to get much more accurate measurements of its shape and its dimensions using uh, optical and radar astronomy, and other groups have been able to measure its mass more accurately by looking at its effect on the Dawn spacecraft, which didn't go anywhere near it, but it went near enough that they were able to get estimates on the mass. And the result is the density is about 4 grams per cubic centimetre, which is about half of what you would expect if it were made of solid iron. But honestly, that just translates into more questions to be answered by this mission to this very interesting object. Psyche is very much a main belt asteroid, with its orbit uh, moving between 2.53 AU and 3.32 AU, and uh, an inclination of 3 degrees, which is very low. Physically, the, well, from the images we've been able to ach achieve, uh, the mean diameter is about uh, 222 kilometers, but it's more like an ellipse that in one axis might be 277, and the shortest axis is more like 168. And the mass measurements make it about uh, 2.3 times 10 to the 19 kilograms, or in regular person speak, 23 million billion tons. And there are a bunch of bad news articles that like to talk about the mass of the asteroid and the fact that it's mostly metal and say it is incredibly valuable. But look, you've got to get there first. The most important mass initially is the mass of the Earth because you have to have a rocket lift the spacecraft against it. For this mission, NASA went with the biggest rocket it could afford, the Falcon Heavy. And this is the first operational interplanetary mission for the Falcon Heavy, because obviously, you know, space dude out in his car isn't really going anywhere but in circles around the sun. But an actual operational mission on Falcon Heavy needed to launch at exactly the right time onto exactly the right orbit. For this flight, the side boosters are able to return to the launch site for recovery, meaning that not only do you get the fire and the flames, you're also going to get the thunder from the sonic booms, which is all pretty important because I consider this to be the most metal mission that NASA has launched in a very long time. And that's before you consider that they're going to sacrifice the center core to the Dark Lords of Delta V, and it launched on Friday the 13th. The trajectory carried the spacecraft south uh, across the Atlantic uh, underneath Africa and then as it was approaching the coast of Australia that was when it relit its engines to boost the spacecraft into its interplanetary trajectory and then the spacecraft separated on its own. Falcon had done its job and Psyche is on its own now headed into deep space. For the rest of its journey the spacecraft will rely on its own solar electric propulsion system. The spacecraft has four SPT-140s, that's uh, stationary plasma thrusters. These are Hall effect thrusters. And uh, they've never actually used Hall effect thrusters this deep into the asteroid belt because Dawn, while it used electric propulsion, it had uh, gridded ion thrusters instead. At full power, each engine consumes 4.5 kilowatts of power and generates about 280 millinewtons or 28 grams or about two ounces of thrust. And initially, when the spacecraft is close to the sun, its massive solar panels will deliver 20 kilowatts of power to enable this. But as they get further from the sun, the power will drop and they can either run the thrusters in lower power mode or just simply turn some of them off. 
This spacecraft has the largest liquid xenon fuel tank I've seen on any spacecraft. It's something like 900 kilograms of liquid xenon. That's 2,000 pounds. And xenon is a very expensive gas. The trajectory also incorporates a gravity assist from Mars. I think it's around 2026. And it will eventually reach the asteroid in 2029, where it has a planned mission of 21 months, bringing it into the next decade. So it's going to take six years to get to the asteroid, and there's actually no intermediate targets that have been identified or incorporated into the flight plan. But there are some science experiments that it's going to perform. In particular, the spacecraft got some extra money because it was going to test deep space optical communications. That is they're going to try beaming data back to Earth using a laser. As scientific payloads get more and more capable, they're needing to send more data back. And frankly, the deep space network is really reaching its limits. So trying to send data optically could transform solar system science. Now, the deep space network doesn't have an optical uh, receiver. What they're going to do is use the uh, the Hale telescope at Mount Palomar. This is a telescope that began construction in like 1928, so it's going to be almost 100 years old when it participates in this. But yeah, the real mission starts in 2029 when they get to the asteroid, and they initially will start in a very high orbit, about 70, uh, 700 kilometers out, and slowly, uh, over time, there will be multiple phases as they drop to lower and lower orbits. The closest orbit they're in, they will have an orbital period of just over three hours. They will be 75 kilometers above the surface of the asteroid. And obviously, getting in close lets them use all their instruments to their you know, greatest potential. They will also have inclined orbits over the poles, and these will be used for gravitational mapping, primarily just by looking at the Doppler shifts of the carrier waves. And this is a very important tool because it will allow them to probe the mass concentrations in the interior object of the object. And that will really help understand, you know, what, what are the origins of this thing? And to be clear, these are artists' impressions of what we might find. We, we know that it broadly matches the geometry, but the details we see are all fabricated right now. And it will take six years before we really start to see the truth that's here. And so those real views will come from the Psyche Multispectral Imaging System, which is a camera system that's pretty much derived from what they put on the Mars rovers. It has like a 1600 by 1200 CCD imaging system with a sensitivity range from the ultraviolet to the near infrared. There's a filter wheel with eight different filters on them to enable them to get color and of course do science. And there's actually two identical camera systems just in case one of them breaks. And those are both connected to two separate uh, electronic assemblies. These are DEAs, Digital Electronics Assemblies. They use uh, FPGAs to do a lot of their image processing. They can store JPEG images or losslessly compressed images. They can store up to like 4,000 of them before they have to start making room for other ones. The optics give a field of view of about four and a half degrees, and that translates to a surface resolution of about three feet or 10 meters in the lowest orbits. Now, the next two important instruments are the gamma ray and the neutron spectrometers, and these basically measure the energies of gamma rays and neutrons that are coming off the, the asteroid. And these can be used to identify the materials, the specific elements in the asteroid. Now, these actually work by cosmic rays just naturally will hit the surface of the asteroid and excite these elements into higher states, and then they will decay or emit neutrons or gamma rays. And by looking at the various peaks, they're able to determine the elemental makeup of the asteroid from a fair distance out. Uh, so the detector in this is like a two inch, you know, five centimeter by five centimeter crystal of germanium that is cooled to liquid nitrogen temperatures. And it has to sit like out on a boom at the front of the spacecraft because, of course, you want to reduce the signal from the spacecraft itself as much as possible. Then the final pair of instruments are the magnetometers. And again, these have to sit out away from the spacecraft to minimize the effect of, well, the spacecraft. Now, there haven't, hasn't been an asteroid found with uh, an inherent magnetic field. They might well find one this time because uh, it is a metallic asteroid. But even if it doesn't necessarily have much of a magnetic field of its own, these sensors can be very important to detect 
how the asteroid reacts or affects the magnetic field from the sun and the solar wind. As the solar wind flows past the asteroid, its magnetic field may change orientation. And the asteroid will react to this, and the rate at which it reacts will tell you, you know, the magnetic properties of the materials that it is made of. So again, very important instrument when you're visiting a metal asteroid. So anyway, those are the scientific instruments. There's another interesting thing about the design of this spacecraft, which sort of sets it apart from uh, other spacecraft that NASA has built. And this one is based on a standard communication satellite bus, right? This is the 1300 bus by um, uh, Space Systems Laurel, which I think dates back to like the 1980s. It's a standard uh, shape and structure with standard interfaces that people build into communication satellites. NASA, JPL, they decided to build a space probe with it. With, of course, the idea being that by not reinventing the wheel, they would save themselves a whole lot of time. Unfortunately, it's not really clear that they actually saved any time after all. And in fact, the project was pushed back a year because the software was behind schedule as they were getting ready to launch. And it just looking into this uncovered a whole lot of other problems with management at JPL, mostly because... JPL was doing too much with not enough people available. And while this delay was no doubt frustrating for the scientists that are running the project, it was terrible for another mission called Escapade, which was a pair of small satellites that were going to ride along during the launch and make their own way to Mars, where they would investigate the extended atmosphere of the planet. Thankfully, those spacecraft have now found a new ride. They're going to be flying on New Glenn in what is no doubt going to set new standards for large rockets launching small payloads. But coming back to Psyche, even although it got to the launch pad in time this year, it still had problems. They discovered issues with thermals on the cold gas thrusters, which were going to be used for attitude control during some portions of the mission. Turns out that they were going to get well, they were going to exceed their thermal limits under some conditions. So they had to make some modifications to mission parameters and software to account for this. But yeah, I'm thrilled that the mission was successfully launched. And now it's up to the mission team to get the spacecraft into flight configuration, get it, uh, you know, get communications, deploy the panels, get it on its way. And then it'll hopefully be a long and uneventful trip to the most metal planet in the solar system. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.